Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The webinar will now begin. I'm Christy Schmidt, Knowledge Exchange and Communication Specialist here at Farm Credit East. And before we get started, we just have a few technology tips to keep in mind while you're viewing today's webinar. First is that all attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. Also, you might want to give your mouse a tap every once in a while so that your screen doesn't go to sleep. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation, so you can text chat in your questions at any time, and then we'll hold them for the end of the presentation. To text chat in a question, there should be a GoToWebinar panel up on the right hand of your screen. Just click that red arrow to expand it and type into that text chat window there, and the questions will come to us here. Also, a recording of today's webinar will be available on farmcrediteast.com slash webinars. Um, this link will be provided again at the end of the presentation, but you can go there for playback of today's webinar. And with that, I'll pass it over to Bob Smith to get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We greatly appreciate uh, your participation on this webinar. Uh, as Chrissy said, this is Bob Smith with the Knowledge Exchange Program at Farm Credit East. We're very pleased today uh, to co-sponsor this webinar with New York Farm Bureau. Uh, Farm Credit East uh, appreciates uh, our great relationship we have with the state Farm Bureaus in the Northeast. Uh, New York Farm Bureau is great to work with, as well as the other Farm Bureaus uh, in our six-state area. And American Farm Bureau is great to, to work with. We have a lot of good friends at AFBF, uh, and uh, they're participating today in this webinar with our presenter that I'll introduce in a few minutes. You know, 2012 was a, uh, was a farm bill year, and now it looks like 2013 is going to be a farm bill development year. So uh, uh, our intent today with this webinar is to give a good idea of where we are today uh, with the action that was taken as part of the fiscal CLIP legislation to extend certain provisions of the farm bill, and to get a little feel for what the outlook is as we go forward. You know, a big election in November, a uh, number of new members of Congress, number of changes, certainly a growing budget situation or changing budget situation. So we really wanted to just get a feel for you know, where we're at with the Farm Bill provisions and, and New York Farm Bureau and Farm Credit East thought it would be good to have this uh, kind of learn at lunch uh, webinar today. Uh, before, before I introduce our speaker, uh, who's going to be a great resource person for us today, I'd just like to uh, ask Kelly Young uh, with the uh, Public Affairs Department of New York Farm Bureau for some comments. Kelly's great to work with. She's an Assistant Director of Public Policy for New York Farm Bureau and handles federal issues, does a great job. So Kelly, a few words? Thank you, Bob. Uh, we're so pleased to be joining Farm Credit East today and presenting this webinar, so I'd like to thank you guys already for your cooperation. Um, I'd like to welcome all of the New York Farm Bureau members who are on the line today. I'm glad that you took this opportunity to join. We're going to have some great information from Dale Moore. I'd like to thank him for, for his time in, in offering, sharing some of his, his knowledge, vast knowledge with you. He really is an expert on the Farm Bill and has been uh, working very hard on passing this. Here at Farm, Farm Bureau in New York, we've been working diligently the last two years to move a farm bill forward that uh, addresses the needs of our farmers here in the Northeast, and uh, we're going to continue to do that um, through September. So I will turn it back over to Bob, but I just want to welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Kelly. And as Kelly said, we do have a great resource today in Dale Moore. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to introduce him in just a second. But I do want to, uh, I do want to encourage uh, the participants today to text your questions in. Uh, the way we've structured this webinar, it's largely going to be a participant driven. Dale's going to cover the overview, if you will. And he'll drill down on a few issues here and there. But the Farm Bill is really hundreds of different provisions, and it's, it's, it's impossible in a one-hour web, webinar to be able to cover everything. So we really want to make this a webinar that uh, you know, provides insights uh, based on uh, our participants' questions. So again, text those questions in. OK, with that, uh, Dale Moore. Uh, Dale was recently appointed as Deputy Executive Director for Public Policy. Uh, and he manages the agriculture and trade policy team of the American Farm Bureau. Dale brings 30 years of experience in public policy and communications to American Farm Bureau. 
Dale's background is very uh, impressive, very extensive. He was appointed by President Bush as USDA's Chief of Staff and served under four different Secretaries of Agriculture, Secretary Veneman, Johans, uh, Acting Secretary Chuck Connor, and Secretary Schaefer. So a lot of experience there. The first time I met Dale, or one of the first times, was when he was in the cage at USDA acting as or, or serving as, as Chief of Staff. He does, did a great job then, and I think he's going to be he's a great addition to American Farm Bureau. He has over a dozen years of experience on Capitol Hill, where he worked in uh, the House, uh, on the House Agriculture Committee, with then Congressman Pat Roberts, who's now Senator Pat Roberts. He's worked uh, a number of different uh, lobbying entities and, and organizations representing agricultural interests, including uh, the National Cattle, Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Kansas Pork Producers Council. He has his bachelor's from Fort Hayes State University, and grew up on a livestock hay and gray farm, a grain farm in Kansas. So with that, uh, and I, I have to point this out because it's on Dale's resume. Uh, Dale has uh, two grown sons, but uh, he also indicates he is uh, a proud grandparent of the cutest granddaughter there is. So uh, with that, uh, Dale, please welcome, uh, we welcome you to this webinar. We greatly appreciate it. Congratulations on your new appointment. I, one thing I, I mentioned to our audience, a number of you know Mark Maslin. Mark is a great friend. Uh, I worked with Mark back when he was with New York Farm Bureau, and Mark went on to, uh, to hold the position that Dale's now taking over. Mark is retiring from his position with American Farm Bureau, and, and we wish all the best to Mark, but we're real thrilled to have uh, Dale Moore join us. So Dale, welcome today uh, to this webinar. Bob, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. I've got to share with you all that uh, if my wife were in charge of the introduction, she would just point out that I am full of it, uh, and professionally so. I uh, have uh, very much enjoyed all the different places that I have worked uh, in town for agriculture and with farmers and ranchers. Uh, and. Uh, when my uh, appointment was announced, I should point out, and Kelly is aware of this, but uh, New York Farm Bureau President Dean Norton, uh, I shared with him that uh, coming from Kansas, I was very, very well versed in wheat and cattle. Secretary Veneman did a great job of teaching me a lot about uh, the West Coast type of agriculture, and uh, Dean has promised to make sure that, uh, that I get a good education and, and don't overlook those issues that are critically important. Uh, to you all in New York, and I welcome that uh, that opportunity to, to get to know some of you on the phone today or on the, the webinar today, and uh, my contact information will be on the, the last slide of this, so if things pop up down the road, do not hesitate uh, to let me know or let Kelly know, and we can get you uh, up to speed on where Farm Bureau is. I'm going to start out uh, today just giving you a kind of a quick overview uh, and you know as much of a challenge as it is for me to be brief on anything I talk about uh, try to get uh, hit the highlights of where we were on the farm bill uh, last year and through the process leading up to uh, the extension what the extension means uh, at least in some general parameters what we expect to see coming down the pike uh, as we get the the new farm bill debate started in this Congress and also touch on a couple of other issues uh, that, that tie in to agriculture, particularly uh, to folks in uh, your fine state. I will tell you that uh, you know I often find myself uh, explaining to folks uh, out in the real world, the boots on the ground, farmers and ranchers, why Congress, why the White House, uh, why this process in Washington is, is uh, so noisy but seems to have so much trouble making progress on any particular issue. And a key thing for me that I kept in mind, something I learned from my granddad and has been reinforced over and over, uh, is every once in a while going back and, and reading you know, Thomas Jefferson, reading Washington, reading Adams, and looking at what our founding fathers had in mind when they put uh, this democracy of ours together and what they were getting away from, which was, you know, in relative terms, perhaps an efficient process for issuing orders, edicts, and laws, but not necessarily one that allowed for much input uh, from the grassroots. Well, we have that in our democracy, and uh, as they set it up, they meant for it to be a noisy, uh, collaborative, participatory kind of a process, and I think that uh, you all would have to agree we've got that uh, 
probably way over the line in terms of the noise part. Now if we could just get back to some of the collaboration. As we jump into this, I want to go take a look at the 2012 Farm Bill process. And one of the things that, that most everybody who's looked at this that kind of stands back, uh, particularly folks that are not as familiar with Farm Bills, uh, it was interesting in that a Senate control or a Democrat controlled Senate and a Republican controlled House, particularly at the committee levels, when they reported out their respective bills out of committee, uh, you had bills that, that by and large were essentially the same bill. There were certainly differences in the Title I programs, uh, particularly for the row crops and uh, the program commodities. Uh, but the dairy uh, subtitle of Title I uh, was virtually identical. It was Colin Peterson, the ranking Democrat on the House Agriculture Committee. Uh, it was his proposal on how to, to approach a, a dairy margin insurance uh, type of concept that would replace uh, the current MILC program. But as you go down through the various bills, whether we're talking conservation, trade, uh, rural development, specialty crops, et cetera, the, the bills were virtually the same. Uh, even in nutrition, where the big difference was not in the policy, but in, in the money that was going to be cut from those programs. We got into a process uh, in 2011 uh, where the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling, and a number of other factors uh, came together in a way that required or necessitated Congress coming up with a solution, which uh, many kind of refer to as kind of the long punt. They created a, a super committee, the Joint Committee on Deficit Reduction, and the idea was that this committee, uh, equal number of House and Senate members, you know, bipartisan type of panel would come up with the solution. I think from the get-go, uh, most everybody, at least within the Beltway here in Washington, pretty much figured out that that was, that was going to just crash into the ground. It was not going to come up with a solution. It was more of a, you know, a good face-saving effort to show that, hey, we're working on something and we're waiting to see what the super committee comes up with. And again, in that process, what it did for regular order uh, relative to putting a farm bill together was kind of dropped a, you know, a big stick in the spokes of the process. And the House and Senate Ag Committees came together to come up with a proposal for that process. As we turned the corner coming into 2012, those fiscal cliff issues, budget issues, as well as the election looming on the horizon tended to more and more interfere with the ability to move forward. And then finally, yeah, at the some call it the 11th hour solution, but uh, it's also important to note that they actually didn't get it done at the 11th hour, 59th minute. It was actually in January on the first day of the year when they actually finished up work on avoiding the physical cliff and within that package. And I think it's noteworthy to point out that one of the few non-budgetary items that was included in that fiscal cliff package was a fairly straightforward extension of the 2008 Farm Bill, which had expired September 30th of 2012. It was a one-year extension, so in, I say this carefully, but in typical fashion here in Washington, we extended the Farm Bill for one year, and by the time the law got done putting it into effect, uh, we had nine months left on the extension. Now we have eight. We're still waiting to see what comes next. When you take a look at the two versions of these bills, again, this is more just to kind of give you an idea, when you look down through this, uh, you'll notice that the biggest difference between the two columns is nutrition. $4 billion in cuts that was proposed last year for nutrition on the Senate side, $16 billion on uh, the House side. The policies to achieve those cuts were, again, virtually identical. But that was the, one of the primary sticking points that prevented us, prevented the House from moving forward. Uh, because Speaker Boehner made it pretty clear. He said, I don't have 218 votes on my side of the aisle. And this close to the election, all the issues that are on the table, uh, basically the determination was I don't have, uh, I can't put a lot of faith in the fact that Nancy Pelosi is going to step forward with the votes I need from her side of the aisle. Uh, to get a farm bill done. Other differences I would point out uh, that just to kind of explain what they mean, you'll notice a, a difference in crop insurance. 
and you'll also notice a difference in the commodity side of it. But when you go through and examine the policies, for uh, example, the, the House side moved a couple of items and the funding from Title I into the crop insurance title, like the Cotton Stacks program uh, is effectively a, an insurance type product now. And they put a little more money into some of the crop insurance enhancement features. But in terms of, of the difference between the $23 billion and the $35 billion between the House and the Senate, uh, was that nutrition cut. The key provisions, uh, just to bounce over those very quickly relative to Title I, because this is where outside of nutrition, where the big debates were occurring, uh, the Senate built around uh, ARC, which essentially was the acre program revised. Uh, it had some tightened means testing provisions. Uh, ARC goes by the uh, sort of nickname of being a shallow loss type program built around the revenue side of the process. Chairman Lucas and Mr. Peterson decided that they needed something uh, that provided producers more options. So their, their RLC, revenue loss uh, coverage, more closely resembles the Senate's ARC version. Uh, the price loss coverage was what they had added to the picture and it brought back in you know, reference prices or target prices, uh, if you will. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the dairy provisions in both bills uh, were virtually identical. The 2008 Farm Bill, I've mentioned that it expired, uh, or the, the extension that was passed uh, you know, about a month ago, that expires uh, September 30th of this year. The crop programs are uh, should have added a a qualifier there. They are virtually the same. Uh, what I, you know, when you look through, uh, there are some differences. For example, on uh, the dairy program was modified, uh, and there are certain features that were authorized, uh, like disaster assistance uh, for livestock, specialty crop, and uh, tree producers. Some of the specialty crop provisions and organic provisions uh, will actually need congressional action to fund for them to be in effect, uh, to be effective programs for producers this year. The one thing that, that basically pushed the extension, the straightforward extension process through was the fact that uh, the agreement between House leadership and Senate leadership was that it couldn't cost anything. Now there are some nuances in that as well and dairy is one of those that, that benefited at least a little bit in terms of getting some additional funding relative to restoring the milk program for uh, over the next eight months. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, MILC program was extended. Uh, it restored the 45% rate, uh, which had dropped down to 35%, and also set the feed cost adjuster rate at $7.35 per hundredweight. That was scored at $110 million, and the funding for that came out of uh, the nutrition programs. Uh, but the other part that uh, I know is of interest to and, and important to you all, uh, again, the sure specialty crop and organic provisions, a uh, number of those are subject to appropriations. Uh, and I don't think I have to tell you all just how uh, jammed up the budget process, the appropriations operations process and everything around the fiscal process in Congress and the federal budget is right now. Uh, just to touch on this a bit, uh, one of the questions that I frequently get asked is, okay, so what was the impact of the 2012 election? How does that change how we're going to move forward on the farm bill? Well, frankly, we had, we had a status quo election uh, with the Senate Democrats picking up some additional members, which kind of strengthened their hand a little bit, but they are still short of that magic number in the Senate is 60 votes. The House number uh, is 218. The House focus as we go into this is going to remain on nutrition spending, and uh, one of the areas, and we don't quite know how this is going to get sorted out, but the Speaker himself has made it pretty clear he's got some real issues with the dairy provisions uh, in the House reported bill from last year, uh, particularly the supply management features tied to the margin insurance. And the White House role. Uh, President Obama, you know, it seems 
kind of odd bringing this up this close to his inauguration, uh, but having experienced this when I worked for President Bush, you know, there are already folks out there talking about President Obama being in a lame duck situation, uh, which means that you know there's going to be some opportunity. Uh, and I think particularly for agriculture, uh, because of how bipartisan the members who work on agriculture on the Hill operate, to get a few things done. But the White House role, and by extension USDA's role, is going to be more focused on what occurs once we get a farm bill, a new farm bill, done in Congress, and how quickly and, and how thoroughly uh, USDA can get that implemented. So far this year on where we're, the, the outlook for the new five-year farm bill, uh, one of the pleasant surprises last week was Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid uh, from Nevada dropped in uh, Senate Bill 10, S10, uh, again, virtually identical to uh, last year's Senate passed farm bill, although there are some changes uh, to cotton, which uh, are uh, are, is something that I will mention here later when I talk about the committee uh, leadership changes. Uh, probably more important than him dropping uh, last year's bill was the fact that as Senate Majority Leader, he sets the agenda. And he identified the Farm Bill as one of the Senate's legislative priorities for this year. And for, for us in agriculture who uh, typically don't see Harry Reid take that kind of you know, leadership statement position on agriculture. This, frankly, was welcomed because uh, it gives us a leg up. It also gives Chairwoman Stabenow the opportunity uh, to really move forward as she did last year and basically being the lead on getting her bill done, hopefully as quickly, uh, if not more so, than she did last year. The committee leadership shuttle uh, shuffle that I mentioned as you're looking at the screen, the picture there, the gentleman in the forefront of the picture is the uh, Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell from Kentucky. The gentleman sitting behind him uh, is Thad Cochran from Mississippi. Mr. Cochran uh, was term limited in regards to his uh, chairmanship of Senate, uh, or excuse me, ranking position on Senate appropriations. Republicans in the Senate uh, apply term limits to themselves relative to the leadership positions. When he stepped back from that position and looked around, he is also the dean of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and he indicated an interest in taking that ranking position. Senator Roberts from Kansas, my old boss, uh, had been the rank, was the ranking member last year, last Congress. Mr. Roberts uh, nominated <coughs> Mr. Cochran to be the ranking member, uh, and in the way the Senate works and kind of follows tradition, uh, certainly, at least from the members on the Agriculture Committee, that gives us a new lineup relative to who's going to be sitting in the room with Debbie Stabenow sorting out the details. The expectation we have, which goes back to the changes that were made in, in S10 when it was introduced, is that there were some changes made to the cotton stacks program. We're still trying to determine the extent of those changes, but I have a pretty good idea that given the importance of cotton to the South and Senator Cochran's home state of Mississippi, uh, we're going to see some, some adjustments, at least in the row crop provisions in Title I. And again, would point out that the, the fiscal cliff issues are still a factor. Uh, you know, while the Senate may get started a little quicker than the House, the House Chairman, Frank Lucas from Oklahoma, has made it clear that uh, they're going to be working on the Farm Bill and discussing how they're going to proceed. But until he gets a clear budget, understands where he can go in terms of you know whether he's got the same cut level as last year in that $35 billion range or needs to be higher, uh, if there are some specific directions he gets from leadership that he's going to have to try to work through his process. And on top of that, be part of the ongoing discussions on the sort of the macro level federal budget process that, uh, frankly, I think it's what been three or four years since we've actually seen the House and Senate pass a budget resolution, reconcile the differences between their respective resolutions, move the process forward, and on top of that, take care of issues like the debt ceiling, like uh, the sequestration triggers that are going to pop up 
with uh, regular frequency throughout the year, those are going to be challenges across the board. Uh, but the expected scope of the farm bill, again, some of this uh, likely or hopefully not uh, a surprise to you all, uh, it, they're going to retain the dairy margin insurance approach, uh, the stacks for cotton moving that to crop insurance, uh, the marketing loan. We are, are very hopeful and, and fully expect that the disaster assistance provisions and some of the, you know, particularly, in, particularly kind of throughout other titles of the Farm Bill, whether it's in conservation, rural development, uh, or specifically within the specialty crop title, uh, programs in those areas that help uh, both on the disaster assistance side, but also more proactively, whether it's on research, on uh, you know value-added opportunities, cooperative opportunities, et cetera. One of the things that we at American Farm Bureau are particularly excited about relative to this is this expanded crop insurance provision uh, that is referred to as FCO, the Supplemental Coverage Option, because the way because it is in the crop insurance title and the way that at least last year it was uh, structured. It basically is available to, to any crop that has a crop insurance product uh, from which a producer can opt uh, to supplement that particular coverage. Uh, for Again, for the crops that have a pretty extensive suite of crop insurance options, uh, you know, SCO may be of, of less utility than, say, to specialty crop growers. I know one of our young farmer and ranchers from Michigan pointed out that that uh, in his uh, he's in the orchard business and among his uh, cherry varieties uh, he's got a couple that have you know crop insurance it's not very effective but with SCO he would have the opportunity to, to bolster that coverage and we also are hoping that some of the uh, investment of you know eliminating the direct payments and other things out of title one the funding for that to expand crop insurance can hopefully expand coverage on on those crops that don't have uh, very many options on crop insurance or especially those that don't have any options currently. Uh, we know that uh, uh, there is a strong commitment to focusing the conservation provisions of the bill on the working lands conservation. This would include uh, in particular EQIP uh, because it, it's recognized, I think, by virtually all of us in agriculture, that is one of the provisions in a farm bill that all producers are eligible for. Uh, it works for row crop producers, specialty crop producers, for yeah, livestock producers. And you know, our push, and I know others are pushing as well, uh, is that if we focus the resources that are available on the working lands, uh, use the, the savings that one can get from lowering the conservation reserve program caps uh, is a much more effective way to achieve savings in conservation while retaining those programs that are particularly important. I've mentioned reaffirming those provisions that uh, specialty crop and organic uh, growers look toward. I'm not going to uh, not going to blow smoke at you and say there's going to be a lot of dramatic improvement in those programs, uh, principally because of the tightness of the budget and and the fact that that some of them are made subject to appropriations, i.e., discretionary spending, which adds an extra step to this process. That once we get the authority in place, then uh, you know individually and collectively we're going to have to put sufficient pressure on again the budget process to make sure funding's available in those areas. Uh, trade, bioenergy, the rural areas, uh, rural development programs will remain uh, with virtually the same priorities, although there may be some scaling back here and there uh, just to kind of balance out the numbers. I mentioned nutrition on this again because of how it provided or was the cause of the inability of the house to move forward to the floor. Uh, that's going to continue to be an issue of the nearly $1 trillion baseline over the next 10 years for the agricultural programs. Uh, the nutrition area represents uh, 750 to 770 billion of that. That's by and large the biggest chunk of the USDA's 
uh, spending year in and year out, and a lot of that obviously is tied to the current uh, overall economy of the U.S. We also know that, uh, and I've mentioned this, so I won't, you know, go into a lot of detail here. But the, you know, the fiscal cliff budget appropriations sequestration battleground is going to continue to be the be the big pile of uh, stuff. Uh, it's not quite the cowboy term we'd use, but that's one area that's going to affect virtually everything legislatively on Capitol Hill. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, trying to get through it, around it, over it, however we get there. But uh, so far, there seems to be no clear indication that uh, Congress has hired somebody with a good uh, front end loader to get it scooped out of the way. There are also some cabinet vacancies. Uh, we know uh, that at least for the time being, you know, the President's indicated and Secretary Vilsack told us at our annual meeting uh, that he is going to remain as Secretary of Agriculture. We've uh, got a uh, new EPA administrator on the horizon. We don't yet know who that individual will be. Uh, there are other cabinet vacancies that also occupy uh, a lot of the, I guess, political capital that the president has with the Senate in order to get those uh, spots filled. And you know, it's kind of a margin issue, but one that we nonetheless have to keep an eye on. I'll make this point relative to EPA because that's a battleground area that all of us in agriculture deal with day in and day out. I was sharing with a reporter who wanted to know if uh, we were excited about Lisa Jackson stepping down. And I said, no, I, I cannot say that uh, because that would indicate that everything we're dealing with at EPA uh, is tied directly to, to Lisa Jackson. Uh, she certainly is the cabinet officer and she certainly has put her mark on some of these efforts. But unless you can convince us that uh, you know her leaving uh, means that EPA is going to pull its horns in and and uh, just take all of these issues off the table, you know, it once again reminds that it's not the cabinet officer who sets the agenda; it's the president. And in in uh, a nod to bipartisanship, I would point out that the issues that we fought here at the Farm Bureau fighting with EPA. Uh, are some of the same issues when President Bush was in that we were fighting with EPA, which leads right into the regulatory creep point, and that is something whether we're talking about labor, uh, whether that's child labor or uh, the ability for seasonal workers, you know, a steady, reliable supply of, of workforce, uh, particularly, again, in, you know, I know that we hear a lot from the orchard crops, we hear a lot from specialty crop producers, we hear a lot from dairy producers as the importance of getting uh, ag labor issues straightened out, which necessarily are going to have to be part of an immigration reform package, which is never easy in any Congress. We've already touched on the ag workers and, and immigration reform. We are working as part of a coalition, a broad coalition, uh, that includes the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, uh, which I know our, our farm credit partners uh, on the webinar today are, are part of that effort. Uh, again, it, it's going to take a lot of uh, you know diligent work uh, focusing on the ag worker side of the equation while at the same time dealing with some of the issues uh, that could come up and bite us on the immigration reform side. On the farm bill provisions, uh, I've also had a few visits uh, with some of the, uh, the organic interests around town. Uh, they continue to, you know, to put pressure on the House and Senate Ag Committees, uh, you know, in areas such as crop insurance, uh, to to come up with policies that reflect, you know, the the inherent differences and values in in organic crops versus uh, conventional types of crops. The organic folks also uh, expressed an interest in uh, the areas of of I guess the the compatibility, uh, the good neighborness approaches on, you know, biotech, conventional and organic agricultural producers uh, working and operating side by side and some of the inherent issues that have popped up at least in different parts of the country. And, and also the marketing opportunities. We saw a lot of uh, emphasis, particularly by USDA, particularly by the Deputy Secretary uh, Kathleen Merrigan uh, on you know, not just, you know, the large-scale farming, uh, you know, the, the 
uh, using specialty crops as kind of the example, you know, the, 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 the fruits and vegetables that get into the store shelves uh, in the fresh as well as, you know, the processed fruits and vegetables, uh, but also things like the farmer's market, the local marketing kinds of opportunities that are out there that I know play right into, you know, in some cases the value-added producer grants, uh, you know, talk to a number of, of groups around the country that have, have used those grants uh, for a number of producers to come together, you know, whether in a formal cooperative or, or an informal uh, cooperative uh, to build, you know, processing sheds, uh, you know, uh, packing plants, or to build, uh, you know, the that uh, sort of permanent roadside stand that they can all participate in, i.e. a farmer's market. We're going to keep an eye on on the EQIP program in particular to make sure that as things relative to the budget come into play on all the farm programs, uh, that in the effort to scale back in conservation, that the non-program producers across the country don't lose uh, the opportunity and the resources that are available to them under EQIP, whether it's on the voluntary side of the equation or in those instances when the EQIP dollars uh, provide a critical uh, assistance uh, for producers having to comply with federal or in some cases state types of en environmental regulations. So uh, we get to the cat herding part of the process, which is, you know, back to the budget. I uh, was talking to uh, our chief economist, Dr. Young, Bob Young, uh, who worked for Senator Pat Leahy from Vermont uh, when he was on the Hill. And one of the things that, you know, we're waiting for numbers. We're constantly waiting for numbers in Washington. Uh, we've been expecting for some time, and it keeps getting pushed back, uh, when we're going to see uh, a a uh, baseline that will give us some idea of where to expect, you know, the spending cuts, uh, whether they're going to come up with a deal to avoid the sequestration, which right now uh, it's certainly a long ways away from a deal, but one of the things being proposed is a 5% cut for the non-defense side of the equation, uh, which having worked at USDA, I can tell you, will have a significant impact not only on uh, the ability of, of producers to receive benefits through various programs as they get cut back, uh, but also in terms of personnel. Uh, one of the impacts that could be particularly troublesome uh, in the longer term is Congress gets a farm bill done, but if we have a sequestration that it effectively forces a downsizing in terms of uh, staff resources at USDA, and then it's time to implement the new farm bill, uh, we could find ourselves with that implementation process strung out simply because of a lack of resources. There's also the factor that plays into should this 5% sequestration occur that, that uh, those of you who are particularly uh, knowledgeable about uh, spreadsheets and cash flow uh, is that there's uh, when this sequestration would occur on March, if it occurs on March 1, then the Secretary of Agriculture has to achieve uh, the equivalent of a 5% cut on his total budget on what's left in the budget for the remainder of the six months of the fiscal year. Uh, and I'd be lying if I told you I knew exactly how that was going to impact because, you know, the, the outlays that flow out of USDA are not linear. Uh, some programs occur early in the fiscal year, some later, uh, but it's going to affect virtually every program area at uh, USDA. With that, uh, Bob, Christy, Kelly, I'm going to shut up and uh, let you all ask some questions. And I just warn you guys right up front, um, Kelly knows this because she's experienced it, easy questions get short answers. Uh, the tougher questions, I'll prove to you that I've worked in Washington for 30 years. <laughs> okay, Dale. Well, that's that's a great uh, segue uh, into the Q&A section. Um, we have a number of questions in. Let me just uh, note from the outset, you know, I don't think we can expect Dale to know everything. He certainly knows as much as anybody, uh, any single person on this. But if we do have a specific question that, uh, you know, Dale doesn't feel real comfortable with, uh, Kelly and I will work with Dale. We'll get you a response to the to the folks that have emailed in. 
or text it in. We have a lot of different questions. Uh, so I'm going to start with a general one here, uh, Dale. Uh, from this, and the question goes, from the standpoint of production agriculture, is it still worth it to have the, the human nutrition title food stamps in the farm bill, or will we be better off if they were decoupled from traditional farm programs? Bob, that is a, a very good question and one that, uh, you know, to avoid equivocating, I will just simply say no. And the reason is this, there, you know, we can go back over, you know, the, the seven farm bills, including this one, that I have worked on. And, you know, this go round, it, it would be relatively easy to make a case that, well, if we didn't have to deal with nutrition, we'd already have the farm bill done. Uh, I think in fairness to the nutrition title, uh, not commenting on you know the size of it or anything else, the reality is that that nutrition title uh, is worth anywhere from 40 to 70 votes uh, on the floor uh, on virtually every farm bill that I've worked on. Uh, it can also flip the other direction. There will be a number of, of urban members, Republicans and Democrats, that without that uh, nutrition title in there uh, would be a much tougher lift for uh, Chairman Lucas and uh, Mr. Peterson uh, to get folks to say, you know, please vote for this. Uh, it would make it much easier for those same urban and suburban members to say, well, you know, I need some funding Dale? for my prog. Yes? Somebody just cut in? Well, point being that, that the short answer is I don't think that it would be uh, a good strategic move to cut that out. Uh, it is a frustration, but it is one that uh, uh, is very critical to getting a farm bill done, particularly on the House side. Dale, it's Thanks. Kelly. I can't hear Bob yet, but hopefully he'll chime in. Uh, can you, Dale, um, since I can't see any questions, I'll just give you one. Um, what kind of timeline do you see as far as the House? The Senate introduced a bill, but what kind of timeline do you see for the House to maybe uh, put their bill out there? Uh, Kelly, I would anticipate the House, based on what we've heard from Chairman Lucas, uh, we could see it uh, in late March. I think more likely we'll see it uh, somewhere uh, in that post-Easter time period between uh, you know, mid-April and Memorial Day kind of a late April, mid-May kind of time frame. The Senate, uh, while their bill is on the table, uh, I don't know that their time frame is going to be a whole lot different, but would, would expect, or better put it, anticipate that uh, Chairwoman Stabenow may get started uh, hopefully in this, you know, kind of late March, if not uh, mid-April uh, to late May time frame as well. And I know this is asking you to look into your crystal ball a little bit, but we've seen, you know, Congress does well, a lot of things too. Are you back, Bob? Can you hear us, Kelly? Yes, I can. Apologize for that. We, I think the uh, the problem might have been at our phone. But uh, I welcome back and thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Dale. We apologize for that. Uh, can you hear us okay at this point, Kelly? Yep, you sound good. We can. You sound good. Okay. Next question related to the crop insurance program, and the, the question went something to the effect of uh, a crop insurance is now the largest expenditure uh, relating to farm support program or programs that directly relate to, to the farm community. As you pointed out, 75% or more of the uh, farm bill dollars go to nutrition. Uh, in light of where the crop insurance program sits as far as expenditures go, is it likely to be a target of budget cuts uh, uh, next uh, this year when the when the farm bill is considered? Bob, that's a very good question. You know, last year both both committees, both the Senate and the House, again this bipartisan approach, had identified crop insurance as the one area that that not only was going to be protected from the budget cuts. But uh, frankly, that was where, when they eliminated the direct payments, which are worth roughly $5 billion a year, uh, that a lot of that was going to go into that area. Uh, we also know that when we got to the Senate floor, we saw a number of the, the means testing type of amendments 
uh, that tied you know crop insurance back to conservation compliance. That was a big push by the Environmental Working Group and others uh, in the you know environmental activist side of the equation and others. Uh, something that we opposed. Uh, there was also provisions that uh, for producers who have an adjusted gross income above seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars would have to would have a reduction in uh, the the premium subsidy that they receive. I would anticipate that you know uh, one thing I didn't mention, but when the Senate bill was on the Senate floor, there were over three hundred amendments that were in their term of art were posted to be considered uh, relative to the Senate Ag Farm Bill. The uh, they worked out a deal and considered 70 of those, but I like folks to kind of to put it in perspective. When you subtract out the non-germane uh, amendments like those that related to the war in Afghanistan and you subtract out the nutrition title amendments, both you know for more benefits and for bigger cuts, there were still roughly 230 to 40 of those amendments were focused on other provisions in the Farm Bill, a number of them raising the question about crop insurance. Now that we've had a, you know, another severe drought like we had in 2012 and the indemnity payouts uh, are coming in and those outlays are going to be part of the, you know, the public record as well as the debate, I would anticipate that there will be calls for you know, both a reduction in the funding for crop insurance as well as some changes uh, you know, in terms of the laws and regulations governing how those uh, programs operate, that's going to be an area that, that we are particularly focused on, making sure, uh, to put it simply, that we protect the crop insurance programs we have uh, as well as uh, continue to build strong support uh, for expanding and enhancing crop insurance. I've you know, I've noted time and again that uh, going back to the early 80s, each time that there was a disaster that sort of outstripped the resources available in the Farm Bill or the crop insurance that was available at the time, Congress was, you know, moved to do an ad hoc disaster program. And in each one of those debates, the question would always arise, why aren't farmers using more crop insurance? And a number of reforms, the, you know, one of the latest in 2000 that made some really big changes to the crop insurance program uh, that started this, you know, enhancement of, the, of uh, various, uh, the ability of companies to provide better crop insurance tools that worked better to meet farmers' risk management needs then, you know, in effect, the policy effort that's been ongoing for the past, you know, couple of decades at least, uh, has borne fruit in that more and more farmers are using crop insurance as their primary risk management tool. Now that we've got farmers there, and my argument to the opponents uh, that want to change crop insurance in a negative way is that, okay, you guys were part of the call. Why aren't farmers using crop insurance? Now that they're doing it, you want to start taking that away as well. That's going to be a battleground uh, as we go forward and certainly something that uh, I know you know, farmers are keeping an eye on. Uh, my brother's in the banking business. It's something, it's probably the one thing in uh, farm policy that he follows more closely than anything else because of how critical that is to his customers and uh, their ability to, you know, to cash flow and meet, meet needs uh, when it comes time to repaying the loans that he's extended. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, I've had a number of questions on the research title, and uh, uh, just a general question, uh, I guess. Uh, please comment on the research t title, what's been gained, what's been lost, what's at risk? And along with that, a couple of questions specifically about the Specialty Crop Research Initiative uh, program and whether any funding might be available for that in 2013. So I'm, I'm assuming that program was cut or are not uh, continued as, as mandatory, it was discretionary and therefore has to be an appropriation uh, uh, provision. But a little bit about the research title, where it's going, how it's changing, and, and if you know anything in regards to the Specialty Crop Research Initiative, would appreciate your comment on that, Dale. Well, I, I can tell you, now, I'll start with the Specialty Crop Research Initiative. Uh, in terms of the, the policy and the authority, it's something that, that you'll hear all the right 
talking points, uh, certainly within the committees, that it's very important. Uh, we need to continue it, and, and we need to put as much funding as we can in that direction. Uh, when you have a, a budget process that is cutting the, the level that it is, uh, and I think it's fair to say that, uh, again, leadership on both committees recognizes this, that, uh, you know, in terms of Title I programs, you know, we're talking $16 billion uh, in cuts roughly coming out of the program and looking at last year's bill, coming out of the program and, and going toward deficit reduction. Uh, and you compare that to, you know, the handful of a million millions of dollars that are applied in, in a specialty crop research initiative, uh, and research in general, you know, the, the numbers don't match up, but we all know that, you know, a $10 million cut or a $5 million cut or even a $1 million cut can have a much more dramatic impact on those specialty crop research programs and research programs in general than a $16 billion cut uh, in the farm programs. And I don't, you know, feel too bashful about saying that. I think that from the standpoint of affirming, you know, the members of Congress and, and the push to affirm that those are important programs and we need to keep the authority in place, that's not going to be the, you know, the tough road to hoe on this process. The, the tough part of the issue is going to be securing funding, uh, whether it's, you know, mandatory or discretionary. Uh, that's where the, hesitate to call it the fight, but that's where the tough decisions uh, and more especially where the pressure put on the committee to recognize that, okay, you guys can, you know, shave a point or two off of what you're putting into crop insurance or what are you putting into some of the other even conservation programs to make sure that, the, you know, the specialty crop research initiative, that research in general gets the resources that it needs. One of the things that has affected this, and uh, again, it, hopefully, something that everybody's aware of, but just to keep in mind that we've probably seen uh, kind of two sides of this, this process, because uh, in the past, if, you know, if research uh, initiatives uh, in general were, were cut or not funded uh, in a farm bill, for example, uh, all of us generally counted on the ability to go up to Congress and talk to the appropriators uh, and, you know, uh, whether it's going to the New York senators or the Kansas senators or whoever, you know, putting the pressure on them to push for uh, a, an earmark funding for the programs that were critical, you know, to farmers and ranchers in our particular, you know, areas of the country. Congress so far uh, has held pretty firm to the no earmarks uh, in, the, in the funding or in the appropriating process which has made it more critical to secure whatever mandatory funding or direct funding uh, we can get out of the farm bill debate. Uh, again, one of those areas that uh, is going to have to be watched closely. I can't honestly tell you what kinds of changes may be contemplated this year. Again, a lot of that's going to depend on the budget. But I, I can assure you it's not too early to be letting you know, your congressional delegation know uh, that they need to let leadership on both committees know how important it is uh, for these programs to be funded. Uh, one area in speaking at the research title in general, uh, and I think it's still sorting itself out a bit, is the last Farm Bill made a fairly dramatic change uh, in how the, particularly the cooperative state research types of programs were set up, as well as, uh, you know, the, the special grant type programs that, that were authorized, and, you know, set priorities on the areas that needed to be funded. Uh, specialty crops is one of those areas, but the fact that, you know, at least sufficient numbers in Congress felt compelled to, you know, create the specialty crop, you know, initiative, the special focus on specialty crops within the research initiative indicates that, again, you know, by the time nutrition and food safety and the other priorities that the administration may identify, because they kind of have that, that ability in terms of implementing the program, then there needed to be a special policy earmark, if you will, for funding to go into 
in order to cover uh, you know fruit and vegetable farmers needs that's something uh, you know details uh, you know I can get more detail but right now it's all going to be a little bit ambiguous uh, because uh, however frustrating it might be to you all uh, if you go up and talk to Senate staff or House staff or the members themselves uh, their focus about 90 percent of its on Title I. Right, right. Dale, we have about four more questions. You have another 10, 15 minutes to spend with us. So on, uh, on I'm, the... I'm here until you all get tired of listening to me or, or cut me off. All right, well, well great. Uh, next question, uh, uh, you kind of answered in your presentation, but has help for organic farmers been zeroed out and how can we get it restored? Uh, that's one of those, I, I don't know the exact details on, on whether it's been zeroed out. I know that it's something that, that if I were putting the strategy together right now, I would focus my resources on getting the Senate Ag Committee geared up to make sure that the needs of organic producers are in because, frankly, that would be an easier sell for a couple of reasons. One, Chairwoman Stabenow, uh, being from Michigan, has frankly more sort of insight into specialty crop production in general. Organic production uh, yeah, by extension uh, simply because she's got a lot more of that in her state than does you know Frank Lucas or Colin Peterson or Thad Cochran. Uh, I think that that the growth uh, in organic farming uh, both in terms of you know what we see in kind of the big box grocery stores, uh, as well as the specialty type, you know, like the farm fresh type of uh, grocery stores, and you know the local type marketing that occurs, uh, I can't see those programs being zeroed out without some kind of mechanism to ensure that when this new farm bill gets put together, uh, that there is some priority on that end and particularly when it goes down to the department, if the authority is there, I feel pretty confident in saying that, you know, Secretary Vilsack and Deputy Secretary Merrigan uh, will make sure that those resources, uh, you know, even if they have to be a little creative uh, in their interpretation of certain provisions to cover uh, the needs of organic farmers. And for those of you not familiar with uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan, Kathleen when she worked for the Senate Agriculture Committee, uh, was one of the primary staff authors of the organic title that was in uh, the 1990 Farm Bill. During the Clinton years, she was the administrator uh, in the Agricultural Marketing Service, which had the primary responsibility for writing the regulations uh, that applied to that bill. And the organic bill was one of those provisions of the 90 Farm Bill that actually did not get finished until uh, 2001, Secretary Veneman uh, signed uh, the final, uh, I guess, regulatory bill uh, that put in place the organic standards uh, provisions. That's something that, uh, you know, and then we saw not too long after that, within probably six months to a year, just a tremendous, tremendous increase in organic production uh, across the board and its rise as a factor within the overall farm economy. That's not going to go away. Uh, and I think it, again, one of those areas that the details aren't clear at this particular point, but uh, if I were, if I were putting the strategy together, I would be making sure that, uh, you know, my senators knew what needed to be in that process. And, and both of your senators uh, have, you know, indicated fairly strongly uh, in in various ways there where they hold this on their priority list uh, relative to other issues in the Farm Bill. Dale, very good. Uh, I've got a number of questions, and, 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 and you and Kelly might have addressed this when we were off the line, but as far as Speaker Boehner's uh, position on dairy policy and on the dairy stabilization provision on the uh, new dairy program, uh, basically, you know, what do you expect to come out of the issue as it relates to dairy? Uh, I know you kind of addressed that going uh, in your in your presentation, but uh, given Speaker Boehner's uh, viewpoint, uh, his comments, uh, what can we expect? Well, I would expect that uh, that's going to be uh, one of those fun jobs that Frank Lucas has 
uh, in convincing the speaker that you know collaboration on putting together a bipartisan farm bill that will achieve 218 votes uh, necessarily requires uh, support from the dairy industry, uh, particularly the farmer side of the dairy industry. And uh, it's uh, Mr. Peterson's made it clear that it's you know a critical factor in in both his ability and his desire uh, in you know pushing members on his side to support what the ag committee comes up with. Uh, I will say that the speaker uh, I was working for the House Agriculture Committee when. Mr. Boehner first came to Congress as a freshman, uh, and his position on dairy has not changed uh, at any time that I can recall. Uh, he's never been a big fan of the dairy uh, provisions in any farm bill that, that we've worked on. His, his primary issue, as I understand it, is focused on the supply management features and or requirements um, relative to the margin insurance. Uh, the margin dairy margin insurance program is a voluntary program in that you know producers elect to sign up for it. But if you, as a dairy producer, sign up for the program, then you are required to also participate in the supply management features within the, within that program. Uh, and it's principally uh, to kind of keep the cost, the premium cost, on the dairy margin insurance down. But that's that's the fundamental reason that it's in there. Uh, Mr. Peterson didn't did not put it into his original proposal, and the committees did not keep it in there simply because they feel like they need a supply management feature. But rather, again, it becomes a, a budget factor. That's going to be the you know the fight with the speaker on getting him to accept uh, either what is put on the table you know, virtually identical to last year, or if there's some way to modify that or bring other resources in. Because the other factor in this, uh, you know, not not that many people outside the livestock sector under or know the fact that there, there are livestock margin insurance products out there that are available for dairy. I believe there's one for pork. There's one for beef cattle. Uh, there may be a couple of others out there. Uh, the only one that has been used uh, to any degree that would suggest that it's a viable risk management tool has been the dairy version, and that's only been when Congress has put money in to help uh, buy down the cost of the premium. Uh, otherwise, the premium costs, frankly, outweigh, at least from what most producers tell us, outweigh uh, you know the potential risk management benefit uh, in that process. So. Uh, Short answer is uh, I don't expect the speaker to change where he is on this uh, because he he hasn't in you know the what twenty some years that he's been in Congress almost twenty years uh, but I would expect that both Mr. Lucas and Mr. Peterson uh, that will be one of those uh, provisions where they call on Farm Bureau and the national milk producers and other folks around the country to uh, to weigh in heavily. And make it clear that you know we need this provision in there. We're not saying that we're big fans of the supply management feature, uh, but it is the compromise that's been reached, you know, to get the policy in place to replace the, you know, the other dairy programs like MILC, and also meet the budget requirements that you know Congress has imposed on uh, the riders of the new farm bill. Very good. Great, uh, good, great uh, overview as to why it might get done uh, in light of uh, significant opposition. Um, next question uh, relates to the conservation title. Uh, under this Farm Bill extension, what is the status of FSA conservation programs, specifically CRP and CREP? There has been no word of these programs being extended or funded. Currently, we cannot sign up for CRP or CREP at FSA. Do you, do you know, Dale? Uh, yes, I can answer that pretty directly because I, I have dealt with this when I was at USDA, and we, and Congress would not get their budgets and appropriations done, and we'd be dealing with a uh, continuing resolution process. Uh, bottom line is the, the CRP and CREP contracts are, are protected. Uh, even when the Farm Bill expired, those contracts were still in place, so you know they were not jeopardized in terms of you know Congress 
effectively saying to the holders of the contracts, well, guys, we're not going to pay you this year because we didn't get the new farm bill done. But the flip side of that is, with the extension, uh, unless Congress appropriates money and authorizes the Secretary uh, to do new sign-ups, that, that particular aspect, new sign-ups uh, for both of those programs is, is effectively on hold uh, pending the new Farm Bill and the funding for that uh, getting done. And it's going to be, a, a, I think, the CREP program probably will fare better in general terms than CRP because the, the focus you know is supply and demand uh, among the row crops and you know to put some of this land back into production all across the country uh, the criteria for what can go into CRP is going to going to necessarily have to get tighter and tighter relative to the environmental benefits index uh, which is the regulatory term, uh, but frankly, you know, the more environmentally sensitive lands, the more criteria they meet, the more likely they will be able to either enter into new contracts or be extended. But the lands that kind of fall below the crossbar uh, are going to be those that are on the, uh, if you will, the list that when those contracts expire, uh, that's where the reduction in the CRP cap is going to occur. <coughs> Frankly, because that's that's a much more cost-effective way to do it than simply going out and saying, "Okay, we're going to start tearing up contracts," because they are just that. They, these are are you know fairly carefully drawn uh, contracts that, if the secretary takes an action, which Congress either directs or authorizes him to do to shorten the length of one of those contracts, uh, it can cost the government more money than they will save uh, by taking that particular action. Very good. Uh, down to two more questions, Dale. Uh, next one is an uh, interesting one I hadn't thought about. Is there any movement on getting horses included as livestock in future farm bills? As of now, equine is specifically excluded, which means horse farms are not eligible for any assistance in the case of a natural disaster, specifically Hurricane Irene, which hit in, uh, in the fall of 2011 up here. Uh, so anything uh, you're aware of relative to discussions on horses being included as livestock and future farm bills? Um, I will tell you that that's, that is an issue that comes up every time there is a d disaster discussion. And uh, the unfortunate situation for, uh, I'm not quite sure how to describe, for normal or uh, regular-sized, family-sized farming uh, horse operations uh, is the fact that when Congress has de debated this in the past, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican Congress or a Democrat Congress, uh, at some point in that discussion, what pops up are uh, pictures. You know, members will go to the floor and show a picture of, uh, and I'm not picking on them, it's just one that comes to mind, Columet Farms or you know one of the the grand horse facilities in Kentucky they usually focus on Kentucky because of Senate majority leader McConnell's tie to uh the horse folks in in his state in that industry in his state and the unfortunate thing is that congress has not yet figured out uh or it doesn't have the political will to find a way through the path that you know uh folks who raise horses uh, whether for recreational purposes uh, or for, you know, as part of their operation, like in a ranching operation, or, you know, their principal business is, you know, selling, raising and selling horses uh, for whatever use. Uh, they basically, uh, not trying to be smart here, but they, they get gate cut uh, because Congress doesn't want to deal with the perception that they are helping the large uh, scale type horse operations and this is one area that that uh, any discussion on horses usually segues pretty quickly into the issue, you know, issues of horse slaughter, horse transportation, and uh, when it comes to disaster assistance, uh, unfortunately, the horse folks pretty much get left on their own. 
Gail, next question, last question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to anything that you would like to finish with. But um, uh, in the next farm bill, is there a possibility that the conservation compliance provisions, uh, sod buster or swamp buster, would be revised to be more producer friendly? Currently, a producer could pick up new land not knowing that a previous tenant drained a wetland and they are responsible and liable to mitigate the wetland or lose benefits and pay back farm bill program payments. So anything that's swamp buster, sod buster, uh, that could make, make it more producer friendly? Uh, I would say that, uh, uh, again, a very good question uh, and a very frustrating question. Uh, my quick answer would be uh, I would not want to bet much of the farm on that. Uh, that is an area where uh, you know the hardcore environmental activists, with uh, you know at least if not tacit approval, uh, sort of a lukewarm opposition from more mainstream conservation and environmental groups, including some more agricultural centric than you know simply environmental uh, wildlife habitat centered. Uh, fight those kinds of provisions. Uh, it is something that, that gets raised, uh, and as I mentioned, something that more likely an opportunity to provide uh, an opening in that direction relative to the House Ag Committee uh, and the Republican majority there, because Chairwoman Stabenow would have a very tough time uh, with some of her fellow senators, uh, not so much on the committee level, but you know, in the Senate body at large. And for good or bad, uh, I grew up on the House side, so I, I always have to be careful making too much fun of the senators. But the senators, uh, each individual senator has the ability to, to stop something. Uh, and they can be, you know, if you are the chair of a committee and you're trying to get a bill through the floor and you've got, you know, like last summer, 70, 80 amendments to get through, uh, you know, trying to pick your fights carefully becomes part of the process, and we tend to see that. Well, I'm not going to fight. Uh, I'm not going to fight Senator Boxer from California on this. Uh, I'm simply going to, you know, indicate that we don't support that amendment, or going to argue that it shouldn't be brought up <clears throat> because we're not going to go down that road. I don't think that the standards or the criteria will necessarily get tougher, but the kind of the, the type of situation that you outlined is something that, uh, frankly, I think if the secretary were giving, given something as simple uh, as the ability to essentially make a, a reasoned decision, uh, you know, look at the facts and indicate, you know, somebody bought the land in good faith, did not realize that this was there, uh, this, the, the type of situation you outlined was, you know, part of that legacy of that particular property, then either through, you know, sort of a jump to the head of the line in terms of, of technical and cost share assistance on mitigating or uh, basically kind of declaring a no harm, no foul, uh, and we'll work with you on a conservation plan to make sure that no further, you know, their term of art degradation or reduction in wetlands or you know conservation or et cetera occurs um, and that's just kind of off the top of my head um, but it's it's one of those areas that uh, the focus would have to be I think more on the house side than the Senate side to get some play on that well very good I think that covers uh, the questions that came in if uh, uh, we combined a number of questions, and I, but I hope uh, we got to uh, the questions of all the participants. Gail, you did an outstanding job. I just the, the detail that you know about so many different provisions is is, is outstanding, and, and we greatly appreciate it. We look forward, Dale. Uh, hopefully, we can talk you into coming back again on this. Uh, before we close off uh, again, Dale, I want to thank you, Kelly. Any uh, any last message you'd like to give? No, just to thank uh, thank you both for, for helping put this on and for the really great information you provided today. 
Well, thank you, Kelly. Uh, a recording of this is, is available for anybody who would like to review it. Uh, you can go to farmcreditgeeks.com webinars, and you'll see a recording of this and some other webinars that have been put on. Uh, but we greatly appreciate New York Farm Bureau's uh, assistance with this and the outstanding uh, effort that uh, Dale made. Dale, any last uh, things that we ought to be thinking about at this point in time as we close off today? Well, Bob, I, I want to thank you and, uh, you know, thank Kelly and Christy for uh, putting this together, for inviting me to come on. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, you know, to share what, what I, I know and what I can speculate on. But for me, more importantly, uh, I get back to our founding fathers, the fact that, that uh, you all put this together and this, you know, this uh, cooperative venture between, you know, Farm Credit East and, and New York Farm Bureau and all the folks that uh, took time out of a, what I'm sure is a busy day uh, to listen. Uh, you all have, have anteed in and are active parts of what it takes to get anything done here in Washington. You are active participants in this wonderful democracy we have. I'm more than happy and always available to answer any questions you all might have. And, and I see that you've got, you know, Kelly's contact and Christie's contact information up there. I will tell you I have known for a long time and worked closely with, you know, Ken and Jeff and the guys over at the, uh, you know, farm credit system here in Washington. So anything I can do to help, uh, you know, down the road, whether it's answering questions one at a time or getting back on here and, and doing another webinar, always look forward to an opportunity to prove that I am full of it. Well, Dale, we, we appreciate it. You know, it could be an exciting year if we get a, if we get a good farm bill uh, that has some meaningful provisions and, and we know what to, to expect in the future. And we get a good immigration uh, guest worker bill for agriculture. Uh, it could be a pretty a pretty good year. Uh, so um, uh, we all need to work toward uh, getting those uh, changes made. So Dale, thank you very much. I'm going to close out the webinar. Again, a recording is available as you see on your screen. And if you have any comments, uh, please uh, email Kelly and Christy with uh, you know other topics that you would like to see webinars for. We would love to know. So with that, everybody, have a great day. Uh, Dale, thank you again. Kelly, thank you again. And uh, thank you to our participants. Bye. All right. Nice job. Thank you all.